lecture on astronomy, sponsored by the Rutgers Astronomical Society. Tonight's speaker is someone who has greatly advanced humanity's understanding of the language of the cosmos. Uh, he is a uh, Board of Governors Professor of Mathematics, uh, Jerome Salzberg, but uh, you might know him as Dr. Z. Uh, the title of his talk tonight is uh, One Era Science is the Next Era Superstition. The rise and fall of astrology and the future fall of so called infinity. I'm very really impressed that Viraj, who single handedly probably founded this great astronomical society. And when he was my student in two courses, and was one of my favorite students, because unlike many students, who is only interested in getting grades, uh, he has as many other interests. And in spite of this, he did very, very well. That's why I could not say no to the invitation, even though I know next to nothing about astronomy. Since I know a little bit more about astrology, I decided to talk on what I do know. Okay, so the first, uh, maybe one half or maybe one third, will be about astrology. A few days ago, I walked home and it was already uh, dark uh, and I saw a beautiful sight in the sky. Uh, it was a moon, a quarter moon, a crescent, and almost next to it was a very, very bright celestial object that I knew from Amiga astronomy could not be serious. It was too bright to be serious. Hence, it had to be Venus. So it was very nice seeing that the moon and the Venus together. But I did not attach to it any personal significance or global significance. Yet many, many smart people, much smarter than you, even much smarter than me, <laughs> until about 400 years ago, attached to it great significance. They believed that the future and the present and the past could be told from reading the skies. The science that nowadays is not even a pseudoscience, a psychology is a pseudoscience, economics is a pseudoscience, but astrology is not even a pseudoscience to most people. It's just, I don't know, a superstition and gibberish. What is respectable mainstream science and lots and lots of smart people believed in it and practiced it. Let me just give you a sampling of the very, very smart people. Intellectual giants. Giants who believe in it. Of course, the great founder of modern astrology, of course, 2,000 years ago, roughly, it was modern, uh, is Ptolemy. Nowadays, he is remembered as a great astronomer. Of course, a little bit misinformed because Copernicus proved him wrong, but still we do pay him great respects as a great astronomer, especially experimental observational astronomy. Ptolemy lived circa 1980 to 168 AD. A little bit later, another giant, Johannes Kepler that nowadays is remembered in the textbooks for his three planetary laws, the foundation of modern astronomy that led Newton uh, to the great Principia. Uh, and he lived. And some people tried to rewrite history. They said he only was doing astrology to make a living. That's really, really stupid. Johannes Kepler was far and foremost an astrologer. For him, his purpose in life is to understand astrology. And astronomy was only a tool, an experimental tool to establish it. And the, plan the three laws of Kepler were not derived to the calculus differential equations. He had the same underlying platonic belief that in astrology that there is uniform beauty in heavens. Also, the now discarded uh, model with the five platonic solids, at the time there were five planets. So he saw the corresponds between the five platonic solids 
and the five planets and that for him he was the proof that there is harmony and God exists and he was sure that the only five planets and for him so he was a platonist and for him astrology and astronomy were really intertwined and he'd be rewriting history of saying that he was an astronomer who only had to make a living yes. like I have to make a living teaching calculus yes. Yes. this is much more apt yeah. Later on, in the second half of this talk, I'm going to talk how all the calculus that I've taught, in particular in this very room, is complete nonsense. But to make a living, I have to prostitute and <laughs> teach the party line. In a much better way of teaching calculus, which I hope to have time to later on talk about. But now, let's continue with astrology. And another great astrologist, astrologer, who was even a great greater alchemist was Isaac Newton who lived between 1642 and 1727 only one quarter of his time he was doing real physics and calculus the rest of his time was theology and, and alchemy and astrology and if you read as many people a modern quote unquote scientist who read as and manuscripts get shocked eh, and disgusted how such a smart guy can be so superstitious. So, eh, but I think he's still a smart guy. Even today, no longer, no self respecting physicist would admit, or mathematician would admit to believing in astrology. If they do, they stay in the closet. It's no longer politically correct to admit to believing in astrology. Of course, in the closet, you can read the horoscope, and you can do what you want. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's not yet a way of, but nobody would declare, uh, or people who think of them as a crackpot. But, another pseudoscience, psychology is much more tolerated. One of the giants of psychoanalysis, uh, Carl Jung, was a great believer and he only died uh, in this century, almost 50 years ago. He was a great believer in astrology. And another, not as great or as famous uh, psychologist, not a psychoanalyst, but uh, is Heisenberg. Oh. He Heisenberg. He only died in 1997. He wrote a book. Astrology, science or superstition. And it was clear that the answer is it's the science. And he had lots of proofs that other people discredited, but he believed in it, and they have it. Like few people, no physicist or mathematician, or even chemist, or even biologist would openly admit that astrology is valid, like these people did. So you do have to pay due respect to astrology. Also, we should not be disgraceful. The reason we have modern astronomy was because of all these giants. And we stand on the soldiers of all these giants. And their motivation was astrology. They did not care what they say about uh, uh, having the uh, planets go exactly how they go. They wanted to use it to predict the most interesting thing. Then by common thoughts in many newspapers, not say pretentious, in the New York Times, we don't have horoscopes, but the more low world newspapers all have horoscopes, and, and about the so called common people, still people believe uh, in astrology. Because astrology is much more interesting than the called arid science that is objective and doesn't care about individuality. We care about ourselves, and even we, even we like to know what's going to happen. Maybe if it's uh, with probability, 99% won't happen. It's still fun to read about the future, even if it is uh, erroneous, and some people believe in it. So, looking down on past generations of the so-called superstition belief, I called, and I then Googled it, so it turned out I did not make up the term, time chauvinism. Unfortunately, the term chauvinism goes back to Napoleon, and possibly a apocryphal a soldier uh, of Napoleon, uh, Jean Sauvain, was blindly faithful to the emperor. 
even after the emperor went to Enba and was clear that the empire collapsed, uh, he was uh, still faithful. So blind faithfulness is called chauvinism. But nowadays it's also blind patriot, pat, patriotism. And the term now extends to many, many things. For example, we all know about male chauvinism. Males are here the meaning seeing that males are better than females. And then we have other kind of chauvinism. Race chauvinism is called racist. It's not all about politically correct to be a racist. So there are still many races, but usually they keep it to themselves or they have more subtle uh, ways of expressing their racism. And then other kinds of chauvinism. Another pet case that is still politically correct, but is not the subject of this talk, but it's one of my pet peeves, is human chauvinism. <laughs> it's no longer politically correct to say that whites uh, are superior or that, uh, I don't know, Jews are superior or that uh, at any rate, or that men uh, are superior to women, uh, or that rich people are smarter than poor people. That, per se, uh, you get in trouble if you say it like that. But still, human chauvinism is acceptable, thinking that humans are superior to machines. Machines have gone a long way. 20 years ago, people did not believe that the chess master, a uh, world master, would be a computer. Uh, until 10, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, Kasparov was in deep blue. There were contests. Computers were still more or less equally matched to the best uh, a human chess master. But no more. Now it's two separate contests. Humans by themselves and computers play against themselves. Whereas it's no longer so. In fact, now it's a problem in chess masters. Uh, in tournaments, they cheat and use computers. Like in calculus, when you use calculators, or you have to go to the bathroom, and then you uh, use the calculator, calculator uh, <laughs> chess masters go to the bathroom, and then quickly use the chess calculator to look at the right moves. And even somebody has a program to detect uh, how likely, of course it's not for sure, how likely this move is human or computer. Computers have a certain way of thinking. But most mathematicians still say that computers can only calculate. Computers cannot think. And, and it's still, uh, when I tell them that in 50 years, all my colleagues, including myself, including Professor Goldstein here, uh, uh, will be, no, not him, <laughs> because Professor Goldstein is not only a mathematician or a physicist, he's also a philosopher. And I still have a grain of human chauvinism. Mathematics and physics would be in 50 years or be done by computers much better than any human, like chess is already done today. But philosophy, I still at least like to believe, is the province of humankind. So there's still some wrong. So I'm also in the science. But now, let me focus on one particular astrologer, my favorite. Rabbi Abraham Ibn Ezra. He lived about 900 years ago, and he was one of the greatest Jewish scholars of the Middle Ages. He was he's famous for his interpretation of the Bible, and is still used today by biblical and by a religious scholar. But he was also, he was a great, he was one of the greatest intellectual giants who ever lived. And he was definitely smarter than me and you. And possibly even as smart as Newton. And he was also a poet, and he was also a companion. But first and foremost, he was also a mathematician. But first and foremost, he was an astrologer. And nowadays they try to break down and seeing once again he did it for a living, he had to make a living, uh, so he had to do it. No, no, for him astrology was intertwined with science, with mathematics, 
and with theology. Everything was embedded together. We didn't have this separation of things. So let me tell you a few of his writings. So he believed in astrology, but only if it's practiced correctly. He, he said that astrology, unfortunately, is abused by many people. That's why sometimes you get the wrong answers, because many astrologers are bad. And then he said, if you look at the book of another famous astrologer, Abu Masho, in about the planets, don't listen to it! Because it assumes that the planets go in equal velocity, equal speed. So it's completely flawed. And then he said, and don't even, sorry, Edgerard, don't even trust the sages of India, because they also uh, don't know what they're doing. All you have to trust is the current experimental astrologers. You cannot trust ancient observations. You can only trust what has been done recently, because uh, it changes all the time. He called it the sages of experiment. Uh, in every generation, generation. So every generation from scratch has to compile its own data to be valid astrology. You cannot trust tables that have been done in previous generations. And after that, in this astrology, the book of the world, Astrology Treatise, he had a great combinatorial exercise. The seven heavenly celestial bodies. He didn't call them planets, because he knew, also for him, the sun was a planet. Seven celestial objects. Of course, he was only uh, repeating what was well known to everybody. The sun, the moon, all going, as everybody knows, around the earth. Sun, moon, uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And he called them the Hebrew word Meshartim, which nowadays means servant. But this is the modern Hebrew meaning of Meshartim, servant. But in the Bible, uh, servant is really made with Sarek HaKodesh, a holy servant. The priests who work in the temple were servants of God. So he thought of these objects as really servants of God. And whenever two or more of these so-called uh, holy servants happen to be in the same house, there is something important. So he had a table. So what the house is? In the north of Zodiac, he divided into 12 houses. Uh, and so on. So you divided into. So what I, you could have seen a few days ago, on Monday, where the moon and Venus were together, next to each other, they were in the same house. So whenever you have two servants in the same house, it's only interesting if you have three servants. It's even more interesting if you have four servants in the same house. It's even more significant. And of course, it gets more and more interesting. And the most significant uh, uh, events that God, according to Indian mythology, happen to be in the creation of the world and will only happen at the end of the world is if all the seven servants are at the same house at the same time. This is this. So the first part of this book of the world is about a page devoted to computing how many possible significant events are there. So you have to do a combinatorial problem. Nowadays, we use this notation. Seven choose two. The numbers of ways of choosing a two objects out of seven objects. So first he computed this. I'll tell you how he did it in a second. Then he went on in the next few paragraphs to compute this. In how many ways can you have 
Slave, for example, Sun, Moon, Mercury, Sun, Moon, Venus, Sun, Moon, Mars, and so on, up to uh, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. And then he computed this. And he computed this. And he computed this. And this he did not have to compute. <laughs> In how many ways can you pick seven servants out of seven servants? For this, he used a lemma. He said, how many ways can you pick two objects out of seven objects? But suppose sun is there. Then you have six ways. Suppose the sun is not there, but the moon is there. Then the moon can be joined with five ways. And so on. And he did this observation that 7 plus 2 is 6 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. But he was too lazy to do the addition. 6 plus 5 is 11, 11 plus 4 is 15, 15 plus 3 is 18, 18 plus 2 is 20, 21. Now he had a shortcut. He was very, very proud of it. So he had a lemma. How to sum up? any numbers from 1 to any given number. And let me tell you, uh, this uh, lemma that he was very, very proud of. Remember, in those days, he did not have algebra. Everything was words. So, in Hebrew, it is, Yadua ki tol cheshbon, she yechubar me'echal, ad eze mispar se yetze, tocha lehot she'or, the Hotsi Omi I call El Hetsio Im Hatsi I Hat. It is known during the translation. So it, it's well known, it's not this. It is known that every, so it's a general proposition, not that for seven, that every calculation. Abraham, meaning himself, there is another way of computing it. 
which in our notation is square the last number, add to it n, and divide by 2. So for us, it's equivalent. But for him, because he didn't have algebra, and he was very, very smart. So that's the number. In 500 years, or even 200 years, a mathematician will open a journal by some famous mathematician, say Andrew Wiles. And they also make fun because they did not use uh, these antiquated things. Uh, and my guess would be sometimes of computer things. So that's the number, be humble. The same way we now make fun of or condescend this, we will be condescended. So, also we have to appreciate what we have. But as I said, for him, everything goes together. So if you add up everything, you get 120. There was a very magical number for him. Because it's also related to the holy name. If you look at the holy name in Hebrew, you have one hey Jehovah, and you use the so-called gematria, that every letter has a value. The value of the first half of God is 15. If you take that 15 and add up the first 15, in the dog, you get exactly 120. And for him, it was an amazing, amazing thing. Could not be a coincidence. There must be God in the world if you have this. And another thing, uh, if you only look at five of the servants and you do the analogous thing, five to two, by the way, uh, nowadays uh, it's two to the power seven. If you use the binomial theorem. If you do the analogous thing, for five, you get a very, very holy number, 26 is the numerical value of the name of God, of the name uh, of Jehovah. Yeah, yeah. So it's another proof uh, about the harmony of the class. So my point is, for him, even Ezra, who was very, very smart, he believed in astrology very, very much. And nowadays, we think we're superstitious, most people, most scientists at least. But who knows what superstitions we do? And I have two candidates that are closely related. And my pet gift is the infinite. The infinite is only an illusion. There's a lot of illusion. In the old days, we believe that the earth is flat because uh, it looks flat. But then it was realized that if you go far enough, you go back to the beginning that has hit the box from And until Albert Einstein came along, we believed this almost a large velocity, maybe very hard to get speed, uh, but it's very easy, uh, in principle at least, to get. 400,000 kilometers per second. Why not? And the other item said, no way! The speed of light is bounded. It's the biggest possible thing. There's no infinite. And if you look at additional velocity, and it was u plus v over 1 minus u v over c. So if you plug in that, we have two things uh, moving with u and v in relativity. If u equals c, a, you get c, no matter what v is. So the intuition, they can go forever, die with Einstein. Also, a few months ago, there was a stupid uh, uh, Odysseus claim in Italy that they found uh, neutrinos faster than the speed of light. And, uh, and of course, uh, they recently had been and everybody that I knew all day along that I said was right. And that shows how young people are. Uh, because 
experimental value value gamma point. So Einstein is still true. And until quantum mechanics came along, people believed that the wavelength, the spectrum, is continuous. Then you can always have uh, as many, uh, you can go anywhere. And then quantum mechanics thought that it's discrete.